feed your head, engage your brain, and enter the mind's eye in auditorium of audacity. I'm your host in shining armor, DJ BJ Turnoff, representing the mind's eye on Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio. We're going from last week's show about a music legend to this edition's focused on a mythical legend. Because of the many historical mysteries that surround this group, few organizations have taken hold of the world's imagination quite like the Knights Templar. You probably ran into them in your uh, history classes somewhere around the Crusades. It was the uh, secret military organization that started about a thousand years ago. They fought in the Crusades, first recognized by the Vatican, only to uh, be betrayed by them. And when they were betrayed, um, many of them were arrested, tortured, and, and, and burned at the stake. But not all of them, and that's where the legacy started. Where did the surviving Knights Templar go after being forced out of Jerusalem? Did they really take the treasures and artifacts out of the Holy Land in their escape? And if so, what exactly are those treasures, and, and where are they hidden today? I know it sounds an awful lot like the plot to some of your favorite fiction books and movies, but there is an element of truth in these questions. Uh, to tell us how much, we have brought on modern-day Knights Templar, William F. Mann. He's going to spill the beans and probably get kicked out of the uh, fraternal organization by the time this episode's over. Uh, William is an officer of the Knights Templar uh, of Canada's Grand Executive Committee. He's a member of its Grand Council, uh, and he's also served as its Grand Archivist. He also happens to be a member of the Canadian Council of Non-Status Aboriginal Elders, and has been initiated into the Old Middowin's Grand Medicine Society. During his time as Grand Archivist, he discovered written correspondence between two of the most famous and knowledgeable 19th century Masonic leaders, the controversial Confederate General Albert Pike uh, and Colonel James Moore. Encoded in these letters is ancient knowledge uh, that answers these Templar and Rosicrucian secrets that William has decoded. William Mann, he's going to tell us about the last refuge of the Knights Templar after this commercial break. This is The Mind's Eye. You're listening to The Mind's Eye on Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio. Tonight we got Knights Templar Grand Council member William F. Mann. Uh, he's also the author of four controversial books about the group. He's going to answer some millennial mysteries in a few, but uh, first let me tell you about a current one in Malaysia. Now, scattered across the land are these megaliths known as living stones. Uh, some have inscriptions, others are pretty interesting shapes, but no one really knows what the origin of them are. There are a few theories on them. You can go read about them on our uh, social media pages, Facebook and Twitter, at Mind's Eye Show. Uh, also, they're at our website, themindseyemedia.com. And while we're talking about megaliths and mysteries, uh, we just celebrated the uh, four-year anniversary of our conversation with the builders of the Georgia Guidestones. That's right, I kid you not. Uh, you can go listen to that now. Uh, again, um, the links are all at our social media pages, Facebook and Twitter, at Mind's Eye Show. Or you can find it all under one roof, themindseyemedia.com. We got William F. Mann. He's going to divulge confidential information about the secrets of the Knights Templar. You've seen him on the hit H2 series, America Unearthed. You're going to hear him when we return in a Mind's Eye moment. We welcome Knights Templar extraordinaire William Mann to the Mind's Eye Roundtable. Uh, I have a pretty good feeling this is going to be a, a sprawling conversation, William, tonight. Appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. No problem, Brian. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Can't complain. What good, yourself? good. It's a nice evening out, but unfortunately, not too many people are out and about, which is, <laughs> which is uh, beneficial to all the uh, issues that we're dealing with uh, at this point in time. De definitely for the best, and uh, I, I kind of have a, uh, a re very restrictive coronavirus policy on my my show here. There's so. You know, I try to try to not talk about it, but how how can you not at the same time? No, exactly, but and that's fine with me. Let's talk about something more interesting. Well, let's talk about your uh, your your newest book. Um, but before we do, let's let's talk a little bit about your background. We have a, sure. a small bit of a connection. I'm a third degree master mason. Okay. Uh, small fries compared to you over here, but uh, if I'm doing the math right, it looks like it might be the uh, 25th anniversary of you being in a. Uh, 
quote unquote secret society? What what, what prompted your initial search all those years? Well, ago? it's it's interesting. The uh, the Mann family has a real distinctive history in Freemasonry, and I always realized or always sort of knew a little bit about Masonry, but really didn't have a full comprehension of the. Uh, the involvement of my family and, uh, until my mom died about 25 years ago. And we we're going through all her background photos and everything from the closet. And I came across this uh, really interesting picture, black and white picture of my great uncle. And my great uncle was ever since I can remember because my grandfather died before I was born. He was always sort of my sur surrogate grandfather. So 25 years ago, I, um, I got tweaked to the notion that he was uh, somehow associated with the the Order of Knights Templar, a Christian Masonic group, uh, which I knew a little bit about. I knew a lot of the history of Knights Templar because I was always interested and went on to find out that my great uncle was, in fact, uh, 65 years ago, Supreme Grand Master of the Sovereign Great Priory of Canada, Knights Templar, uh, which... Uh, I'm sure you would appreciate, Brian, it's one of the highest orders within uh, within masonry itself, whether it be Scottish Rite masonry on that side or York Rite masonry on, on the English side. I don't know if this is something that you notice because it sounds like obviously you trace your history, but um, from what I've seen, at least with, with Freemasonry, is that it seems like it skips a generation almost like uh, there'll be the grandfather and then he'll influence the grandson. But for whatever reason, the, the father doesn't. Uh, have you noticed anything like that or was that something that you saw in your family? No, no, that's exactly right. And it's interesting that you pick up on that because it does sort of uh, uh, for whatever reason, uh, my dad and I found out uh, later on that my dad and seven of his brothers, my dad was the oldest of 15, were all Masons and, uh, uh, four of my great uncles and my grandfather were Masons, and it goes right back, right back as far as the uh, 18th century that we can always determine that there was somebody involved. And uh, but uh, it's funny, I, I was mainly influenced by my great uncles. Hmm. I had uh, two of my great uncles, Frederick George and uh, uh, Frank Mann. Uh, from as far as back as I can remember, they would sit me on the couch and they would do this pantomime, which I just thought was some eccentric <laughs> English thing. Little did I know they were practicing their rituals in front of me for the various orders and bodies of masonry. Um, and, and we're going to talk a lot about your background tonight because a lot of that is incorporated into this book that we're talking about, Hot Off the Presses, um, The Last Refuge of the Knights Templar. Uh, the Ultimate Secret of the Pike Letters. Uh, give us the premise of the book. Well, interesting enough, uh, I've written three other books with respect to uh, uh, Knights Templar, but they, they involve what I call uh, nonfiction hidden history. And we can go into uh, that a little bit. Uh, but uh, let's talk about this new book. This new book, um, about six, seven years ago, I was... Uh, at that time, a grand historian or grand archivist for the Sovereign Great Priory of Canada. And interesting enough, I um, became the sort of guardian of a number of files, files that had been rescued from the dingy old basement of our old chancery. Uh, and they were half soaked from a flood and different things like that. And going through one of the files, I realized, amazingly, there was 30 years of correspondence between Albert Pike, Sovereign Grand Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction, Scottish Rite USA, uh, between following the Civil War to his death, 1891, and uh, Colonel William James Burry McLeod Moore, the first uh, modern day Supreme Grand Master and Knights Templar of Canada. And uh, between these two Masonic icons, they carried on. Uh, uh, 30 years of correspondence, amazingly. And I realized that there were hidden levels to these letters. So the whole premise of the book or a whole concept of the book is is based, uh, a modern-day mystery thriller based on these uh, the background to these letters. And I incorporate some of the letters in the book itself. You could almost call it faction. How were you able to authenticate the letters? Did you talk to the descendants of Pike and, and more, if there are any? 
No, actually, uh, the Grand Historian Grand Archivist, which is probably the foremost pike uh, expert um, in the world uh, uh, of the southern jurisdiction of the USA in Washington, D.C., I sent him a number of the letters, and he verified the letters were of Pike's handwriting and uh, uh, of the con- context and nature of, of Pike, so he authenticated them. Uh, tell us, what what did you, what information does the letters actually contain, and and what did you find, uh, if anything, was there covert? Well, what what's interesting enough is that, and for anybody who's watched the Da Vinci Code, National Treasure, or any of those types of movies, even the, the History Channel's uh, Curse of Oak Island, they're searching for a, a secret vault, which contains supposedly the uh, so-called Templar treasure. Um, what I discern from some of these letters is that, in actual fact, uh, Pike, Pike had in some manner um, got an inkling, at least, in terms of the location of this vault in, uh, in real time. And uh, from that, I believe he alludes in a number of his letters to the actual location of this vault in North America, where the Templar treasure still lies. And, and that's actually true, because uh, after a while, sometimes it can get a little hard to discern between fact and fiction in the book. So that's actually what you were able to, uh, to, to glean from reading the letters. Sure, sure. So, I, so that's the whole concept or premise of the uh, book itself, is that there's a, a number of worldwide factions, uh, political groups, uh, religious groups that are searching for this vault. And uh, trying to discern, uh, trying to actually obtain the letters and discern for themselves where the vault location lies. You know, we kind of have to bring up an ugly elephant in in the room. Um, Albert Pike. I mean, he he was a general in the Confederate Army. He was involved, you know, in the slavery-based group Knights of the Golden Circle. I mean, are you afraid that incorporating Albert Pike in, into your book would would put off some of your potential readers because of this history? Uh- no, absolutely. Um, I've done a lot of research on Pike himself and spoken to a lot of uh, academics who, who've done more research than I have. Uh, I find Pike fascinating because it, it appears that he was just drawn into, at first, into uh, a circle of uh, evil. And, uh, and he navigated that, and it sounds as though... After the Civil War, he spent his whole life trying to uh, trying to atone for essentially what he did in his youth. So I found that very fascinating, very enigmatic figure. And uh, I'm sure there are others who, um, who are more learned than myself to, that really can't uh, can't digest the, the breadth of this man. To go into he was self-taught to learn 15 different languages, probably seven or eight of them that are extinct, um, and to apply them and to, to have the knowledge and the history and the learning to be able to reconstruct the 33 degrees of Scottish Rite masonry is just fascinating to me. In those letters, doesn't um, he get some of that information from Colonel Moore? The that's, that's that's the real interesting thing. Now, I really don't know how that uh, uh, I have a number of friends in the States. I really don't know how that's going to go go over because <laughs> in many ways, Pike is considered a, a demigod for what he did to for Scottish Rite Masonry in the southern jurisdiction. Uh, from these letters, it's easily discerned that he got a lot of the uh, information from Colonel Moore, who couldn't be more the opposite. Uh, McLeod Moore was your typical British Army officer, very rigid and upright and upstanding, and uh, but and conformed to the military background in as many ways as possible. But what Moore did is Moore traveled a lot in his older age, and he traveled back to his homeland of Ireland, to Scotland, to England, and collected a number of these rituals associated with Scottish Rite Masonry and was actually feeding, from what I can see through the letters, feeding Albert Pike, uh, who was writing uh, Morals and Dogma and reconstructing the 33 degrees. Did 
more know that these because Pike was using this information that would eventually be used to help formulate, I guess, the rituals for the Knights of the Golden Circle. Uh, yes. Did did more know that this information was being used in, in in this manner, or would be? I don't. I don't think he was. I don't think he was because it would surprise me a great deal if more understood um, uh, Pike's full extent or influence uh, 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 throughout the Americas. Um, I think Moore was, an, uh, as I say, an outstanding Mason, as he believed uh, Albert Pike was. And it was from one uh, companion to another that he supplied this information, but at the highest level. And I, I just don't really kind of get Pike in the sense because, I mean, he's obviously a confounding character. Um, part of the belief, you know, from Masons is that all men are created equal. You're, you're, you're on the level. Doesn't mm-hmm. being racist inherently go against this belief? And and I touch upon that in my book itself. There, it's more more wouldn't have provided this information obviously if he knew in in many ways it was being disseminated or used. Uh, Pike himself, uh, I think Pike was a confused uh, uh, character himself. Um, throughout his whole lifetime, he seemed to. Uh, uh, battle between belts of depression and he couldn't sleep. You know, he, he was one of those typically conflicted uh, uh, human beings that uh, had deep, dark secrets. And and one of those possible secrets, or at least that he's been implicated in, is um, possibly Abraham Lincoln's assassination. What did you find there? Well, interesting enough, it, uh, I would say that Pike was involved in that to a certain degree. Pike, but Pike had a very strong, uh, strong feeling that, uh, and a number of novelists have picked up on this over the years, that the rights of the singular or independent states had, had precedent over federal right, rights or nationalism. Um, so I find that really fascinating. And again, we could spend probably two hours just talking about that. Let's let's start. Let's get into the part that I'm sure everybody's really salivating for is talking about the Knights Templar, the Holy Grail. And, and obviously that plays a huge book, because as you said, and before you gleaned from the Pike letters, um, that this was something that he was possibly talking about um, that was encoded in there. So for the uninitiated, at least uh, talk about a little bit about the history of the Knights Templar and, and how the Holy Grail became a part of it. Sure. Well, I'm I, I'm sure that uh, a lot of your listeners uh, very much appreciate the original history of the Knights Templar. Uh, the formal history is that the uh, there were nine original knights at just the start of the uh, 1100s, uh, be, just before the first Crusades. They made it their objective of outwardly protecting the pilgrims, uh, the Christian pilgrims to Jerusalem. Um, against highwaymen, against uh, thieves and, and robbers, but also against the Saracens or Muslims. Uh, and they were uh, very instrumental in instigating the First Crusades. Um, but uh, the underlying notion is that those original nine Knights Templar, who actually evolved from uh, French Jewish families of lesser nobility, uh, they knew exactly where to dig under the uh, Temple of Solomon ruins. And uh, because they were descendants of the original Jewish high priest of the temple, uh, following the sacking of the, uh, the temple in 70 AD. Now, history tells us that, in essence, they discovered something of very of priceless value under the uh, temple ruins. A lot of that has been conjectured to be everything ranging from geological records of Jesus and Mary and the Holy Family to the Holy Grail to the Ark of Covenant and the other relics and artifacts of the ruined temples um, to ancient knowledge which existed before the flood. And they used that knowledge uh, to actually uh, blackmail the church into recognizing them as the official order or the Pope itself. And from that evolved the medieval Knights Templar after, to, uh, after Friday um, the 13th um, in 1307 
uh, through the orders of the French king and the Pope at the time, Pope Clement, um, they discerned or they escaped across uh, Europe to places like Scotland, Denmark, Portugal, and some say and the conjecture is that they, uh, some of them escaped directly to North America and established uh, secret settlements here in North America prior to Columbus. All right, let's 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 take a pause uh, real quick and, and uh, let's we'll continue the conversation. Did the Knights Templars really arrive in North America with the Holy Grail? And um, we got a real deal. Knights Templar William Mann going to reveal fact versus fiction for us after this quick commercial break. You're back with the Mind's Eye. We have William Mann, the Grand Archivist for the uh, Canadian Knights Templar. We're talking about his new book. Last Refuge of the Knights Templar, uh, The Ultimate Secret of the Pike Letters. Uh, we left off talking about uh, the Knights Templar and um, their travel, possible travels to North America. Where's the archaeological evidence for that? The archaeological evidence? Well, it's interesting. Um, you have to assume that the Knights Templar arrived uh, on the eastern shoreline of North America in the uh, middle 1300s. Um, they were absorbed into the native settlements. And a number of people have asked me, why haven't we really discovered um, the villages, the uh, settlements of the Knights Templar? And, uh, and the point that I make is that from a strategic point of view, they intermarried into the uh, native North Americans and were absorbed into native culture. And that's why you won't be able to find too much archaeological evidence other than carved stone stone signs, seals, and tokens that you find along the pathway from east to west to the ultimate location of the uh, last refuge of the next Templar. Uh, you're both Templar and you have uh, First Nation blood. I mean, is that something that's talked about within First Nation tribes? Uh, it is, but secretly. And I belong to uh, a secret society known as the Medewin. Uh, it's an Ojibwe Grand Medicine Society. Interesting enough, I've gone through the rituals of the Medewin over the last 20 years, and it reflects for, on a mirror image uh, the exact uh, uh, ritual of the Knights Templar. Um, so the notion is, is that uh, uh, not only was the Knights Templar physically absorbed into the First Nations, but spiritually they uh, they were would be recognized as men of a very high spiritual uh, being, and that's the only way they would have been accepted into the secret societies of the First Nations. And there was a second wave of Knights Templar uh, a few centuries later in the 17th century, right? There was actually there. Uh, very interesting enough, a lot of people, it's, even those who dig on the. Uh, on Oak Island at this point in time, uh, don't realize that uh, a number of the British Army officers that came over, the Irish, Scottish, the English that came over in the 1700s, uh, early 1700s, the British North America, uh, they were practicing Knights Templar and they were absorbed into the what is known as the Grand Encampments or the Field Encampments and they were distributed uh, across North America at that time uh, outwardly uh, to protect the king's holdings, but inwardly to protect the uh, the trail of the Knights Templar that came before them. So they were still um, keeping the secrets, and they were still aware of those same secrets all those centuries later. Absolutely, and that's what a lot of people don't realize, is that there was, although uh, an underground line, there was a hidden line of Knights Templar, direct ascendancy between the Knights, medieval Knights Templar and the Knights Templar of the uh, 17th and 18th century. So there's that huge difference between those two, and now we're just a couple centuries later with, with you. Are, is pretty much the same thing happening? Uh, pretty well the same, much, much the uh, same thing is happening. Uh, interesting enough, people have asked me, why are you talking about this now? And it's because uh, we're coming to the point where masonry is uh, actually dying out and uh, it's, it's time to disseminate the information that has been treated so secretly, 
recently uh, over the last few centuries. And, and I'm going to quote from the book right here. Uh, there are only a few who truly understand the significance of the Templars' involvement in world affairs over the past thousand years. Um, and I know statements like that probably isn't helping the portrayal of, of, of these Masonic organizations, <laughs> but um, obviously you're using it for you know uh, you know a use and, and for your fictional ta- your tale. So that not only does are you using it as a device, but you're also you know it gives you plausible deniability. I mean, how much truth is behind that statement outside of the Holy Grail stuff? Well, I would say that uh, it all depends on what level that you're talking about. From a physical point of view, yes, the Knights Templar were the first bankers. Do they could still control world banking? No. Um, but the Knights Templar were warrior monks. They achieved a certain level of spirituality that uh, that anybody can can achieve. Um, uh, the biggest thing that I I find that with, once you know the history of the Knights Templar, they advocated that you use reason, reason and logic yourself to think about things, to reason the existence of God, for example. Um, that's within everybody. I, I just wish more and more people would think for themselves nowadays instead of, instead of allowing uh, people to influence them, unduly influence them into thinking different things. And before you touched on some possibilities that could be uh, what the Holy Grail is. Um, in the book, well, I don't, I'm not going to pinpoint which one it is in the book because I feel like that could give a bit of a spoiler sure. alert. Um, but let's just start with some possibilities and, and, and just kind of get your thoughts on it. Um, one idea is that it's um, actual treasure. Yes. Do you think that's true? Uh, in part, yes. Uh, people always ask me, what do I think the Templar treasure is? And I always say, give me the top 25 theories, take about <laughs> five, 5% from each, and that's what the treasure is. There, <laughs> there is physical treasure. There is physical treasure. Um, treasure that's uh, relating to the uh, uh, destruction of the temple. Um and other treasure uh, that was absconded with uh, through a variety of means, and that's being reassembled. Uh, people like to hear that. Uh, part of the treasure is if there is an actual Holy Grail, if the Ark of Covenant and the relics from the temples that exist, that could possibly be part of the treasure. Uh, but it also could uh, contain genealogical records that relate to the concept of the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and, the, and their offspring. Genealogical records that have continued down through the years through the Merovingian kings um, to the Frankish kings. Uh, but uh, there also could be uh, sacred knowledge, and I, as a Mason, I think you would uh, appreciate this, from before the Great Flood, um, from Diluvian times, uh, uh, knowledge which uh, would allow one to control the earth's forces so there's uh, a variety of knowledge and i'll say to say to back to people the treasure is what you think it is in my mind it's the knowledge which allowed the next templar um in medieval times to circumnavigate the world to to um, continue transatlantic voyages uh, from times before Christ, um, the ancient mariners, Phoenicians, Car- Carthaginians, Romans, Greeks, all of that. What you have to appreciate is that there are underlying stories within Native Americans uh, of continuous trade amongst the old world, supposed old world, and new world over 2,000 years ago. Yeah, I always take serious Native American legends um, and their mythology. I mean, there always is an element of of truth in it. You know, for example, um, when I went to the Grand Canyon and, and heard about the Native American legends there, um, and talks about how, and that actually matches a lot of the actual creation, geologically speaking, of the Grand Canyon. So, you know, I always take that um, to heart, um, those legends, and I imagine there's Native American legends of the Holy Grail too then. There is, and what I have found fascinating in association with Albert Pike is Pike was actually uh, um, befriended the Native Americans on a number of levels through the Civil War, but also after the war, he was appointed as the uh, federal Indian agent, 
and spoke for the uh, Plains Indians, the Greek, the uh, uh, Cherokee and the Choctaw, um, amongst other uh, Indian tribes on a federal level in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, it didn't work out too well, but, you know, he always had a reverence for, and this is what makes Pike so enigmatic. Uh, you know, he supported slavery, but on one level, but on another level, he supported Native North Americans. Yeah, it's really hard to reconcile between the two, and I, and that's obviously what uh, Freemasonry has has struggled with uh, since and since his death. Um, and, and there's a scene in the book where Albert Pike is with a um, Native American tribe, and and he goes through, um, you know, like I guess a, a rebirthing ritual of sorts. Um, did that really happen? Him going through, uh, you know, a, a Native American ritual? It actually did, and I can tell you that the description. Um, um, after I after I wrote it and went went back to it, I thought, "Geez, I you know I uh, revealed a little too much within the description of Native North American ritual." <laughs> uh, but I I don't regret it. I don't regret it. Also, from a Medewin point of view, it's it's time for some of their uh, teachings to come to light. And, and and do they share that same sentiment? They do. They do. Uh, once again. Um, uh, given the current uh, world politics, geopolitics, it's time to recognize the Native North Americans not as savages but as learned men, and their teachings can be applied on so many levels, just like Freemasonry. Uh, so, trailing back um, to the letters uh, with Pike and, and the Holy Grail, and and with the Native Americans, and they gave the information or confirmed it w- with Pike, and he supposedly passed that on to Moore. Um, yes. Did Moore ever mention um, anything about the Holy Grail after that point, or, or even was there any evidence that he'd be searched for it? No, not at all. So, you know, if you if you look at it, uh, between friends, Masonic friends, these two icons shared uh, shared the burden of a secret uh, throughout their lifetimes, uh, it, which fascinates me all the more. Um, and I've searched and searched. Uh, trying to discern whether Moore actually uh, disclosed that secret to anybody else, and I don't think he did, which is a real re- reflection upon their uh, Masonic duties. Is the the location that you mentioned in the book, and I'm not going to give it away because I don't want to reveal everything from the book, um, is that where it could actually be, or you just put somewhere that's nearby? Well, it's uh, I didn't I didn't pinpoint the uh, <laughs> the, the full location on a on a map, but I uh, I gave a pretty good general uh, description of the area as to where it can be located, and uh, it's my belief, and I've discovered evidence to uh, to support that that it still exists to this day. And interesting enough, uh, I've been approached by a, a number of well well. Um, uh, very well educated masons uh, from a geological point of view and they've laid claims uh, all over the area mining claims all over the area that I <laughs> that I really identify as the lost King Solomon's mines and uh, through their assay work they've confirmed to the point that they come back to me and, and ask me how did I discern all of this um, and uh, they find it hard to believe that uh, I located the actual location of the vault through the interpretation of the Pike letters, along with the interpretation of certain esoteric uh, levels. Um, they've discerned that there's over two million ounces of gold lying in these mountains. Huh. Wow. Probably, the, probably the largest gold deposit that exists to this day in the world. We're going to have another uh, Forrest Fenn um, uh, <laughs> deal over here, my God, after this mm-hmm. book. Um, do you, are you afraid that, that people might actually go searching for this? No, I, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I always tell them, go ahead, but be careful. Uh, if you've seen any of the Indiana Jones uh, movies, you don't want to be the first one down the hole. Um, <laughs> and, and that tends to scare people off. But uh, in all seriousness, um, no, because uh, as I say, you have to have the eyes to see uh, what's right in front of you, the sign seals tokens. And there are, um, there is a native group that's uh, uh, 
in essence, the historical guardians of this area. The last, and so it actually exists, the last refuge of the Knights Templar in North America. Uh, are they working in conjunction with these Masons who have bought up the uh, the, the nearby land? Uh, they are because of my involvement now. Hmm. So uh, that's uh, that's quite interesting. How would you get involved there? Well, they approached me, and uh, they wanted to know how was I able to discern or to identify the area that I did. And I explained to them, and they were fascinated, uh, even though they were all Masons, uh, they were fascinated uh, that I was able to pinpoint the area as I did. And now they've confirmed through the various say work over the last four years that uh, uh, the gold and silver deposits that exist in this area are beyond belief. And what about beyond gold? Have they found anything else uh, of historical evidence or, or, or you know, importance? We have, but uh, we're not ready to expose that to um, uh, to society at this point in time. There, as I say, over the last 25 years, uh, certain things have made themselves be known to me, and I've stopped asking how or why. And uh, I just ask now, when's the time to reveal it? When's the proper time to reveal it? And now's not the top proper time to reveal it. Is it going to be revealed in your lifetime? It will be. It will be. It will be, uh, let's say, maybe over the next four years. And, and well, wow, um, obviously I'm going to have to have you back on for that one. Is that what the next uh, yeah, piece of work for you is going to be? It is. It is. Hopefully, people will uh, will pick up on what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to disseminate certain information over time, uh, in uh, in hidden ways, and uh, for those who now start to understand it, uh, uh, I'll steadily feed them, as you say, not a drug, but uh, <laughs> uh, maybe some white powder gold that uh, enlightens them to a certain extent. Uh, it's it's coming to the point that, uh, especially with the current world events, that uh, um, society needs something of this nature um, to set them on the on a proper path again. Uh, expand upon that idea a little bit. Well, unfortunately, um, as the pendulum swings from a political point of view, it, it's interesting that there's uh, a number of right wing political groups that have have not taken control, but that are now the formal leaders of certain uh, countries around the world. And uh, I believe that we're on the verge of, of either having the pendulum swing backwards in, into a balance or that there's some traumatic, uh, possibly World War III, that's going to happen. And uh, uh, this virus may be may be the catalyst to what happens around the world. It's it's unfortunate that we're in such a situation, but a precarious situation. But I believe that the Templar treasure should be used for the good of all mankind. Um, therefore, uh, when people when people tell me that they, you know, and contact me and they say no where the physical treasure is and they would split it with me, uh, I say, <laughs> no, you go ahead and find it yourself. If that's the lesson that they take from uh, from all of my writings and from all the information that's out there, they miss the point. Hmm. The point is is that the uh, the knowledge is the real treasure. Uh, so, so you didn't encode the book with the actual location of the treasure, then, is what you're saying? <laughs> I, I did, I did. So you have to go back and look very carefully on a number of levels. Tell people where they can. You know, get information about the book and more information about you before I let you go. Well, more information about the book itself can be uh, gained off uh, my publisher's website, www.innertraditions, all one word, dot com. Um, they're out of Vermont. They're the largest single uh, publisher of hidden history uh, around the world at this point in time. Fat, uh, and fantastic people. and uh, Or they can visit my own website at www.templarsnewworld, all one word, templarsnewworld.com. And they can read about the, uh, the other three books that I've written, uh, nonfiction with respect to the movement of the Knights Templar across North America in pre-Columbian times. 
And I highly recommend that they do go down that rabbit hole. You're going to enjoy that for sure. You're going to learn a, a bunch of different things. And, you know, from one Masonic brother to the next, I, you know, I really thank you for coming on the show tonight, William. Appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome, Brian. It was fascinating. Thank you very much. The Mind's Eye Wrap-Up on the other side. Time for the Mind's Eye Wrap-Up. We're going to go from one mystery to the next. Come back in a week when we introduce you to Eugene Bobum, the inventor of an entire category of archaeological artifact known as the supposedly mysterious Aztec Crystal Skull. Dr. Jane Walsh of the Smithsonian and her writing partner, Brett Topping, uh, they're coming on. We're going to explore the murky world of 19th century archaeology and collecting uh, and also the circumstances that allowed Eugene to sell fakes to museums uh, that would remain undetected for over a century. You got seven days to get your fedora, your whip, and your satchel. I'll see you in a week. Until then, be well and let well be. I'm DJ BJ Turnoff signing off for the Mind's Eye on Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio.